Welcome back to Donzi's World. Thank you for watching. As always, I am your host. My name is Don Fapiano. I am Donzi. Now today, in Donzi's World, I am going to bring you the most entertaining show you have ever seen. Because I am going to tell you some of the most wonderfulest stories that I always like to tell when I'm hanging around with friends or I'm at parties, I like to tell my stories. Now you're going to hear my stories and we're all going to get so excited. And before this show is over, you might even see Donzi singing a song or two. How often do you get to see that? Think about it. But the first story that I want to tell you right now is um, a story that I heard one day around Halloween time. I was down on the Yale campus and actually in one of the churches on the Yale campus there was a haunted house and at the end of the haunted house tour uh, there was a guy reading ghost stories from a book and then people would sit around and listen to his stories. Well he read this really interesting story that I'll remember forever and I think it's great. See if you like it. So the story is that there's this farmer man and the farmer is at the county fair and he's going around he's playing all the games and he's riding the rides and he's having a good time at the fair. But then as he's walking down the midway he sees a tent and the sign on the tent says, Have your fortune told by the witchy woman for five cents. So the farmer man, he never saw anything like that. He lives a farmer's life. That's kind of strange to him. So he's kind of interested in it. So he goes into the tent. And at first, it's so dark in there, he can't see anything. It's his eyes have to adjust, but then after a while, then he can make some stuff out. There's like trinkets all around and like dragon statues. And finally, when his eyes fully adjust, he could see her. There's the witchy woman sitting in her chair with her turban wrapped around her head and wearing her witchy clothes. And she's sitting in front of a crystal ball. And the witchy woman says, come on in. Have a seat. Let me tell you your future. So the farmer sits down. He gives the witchy woman his nickel. And the witchy woman looks into her crystal ball and she says, oh. And she's looking, looking. And she looks at the farmer with this strange look on her face. She says, I'm seeing something in my crystal ball. She says, um, she says, you've got a very close friend that you see every day. But there's something strange. I'm not getting a clear picture. Let me look again. So she looks into her crystal ball and she goes, Oh. And she looks up at the farmer. She says, Your friend is a horse. And the farmer says, Yes, that's right. My horse is my best friend. Every day we go out in the field and we dig the field and we, and we grow potatoes. Every day me and my horsey friend grow the potatoes. He's my best friend. So the witchy woman looks into her crystal ball and she sees something else and she looks up and she tells the farmer, your friend the horsey is going to be the cause of your death. That's your future. And the farmer is shocked to hear this news. And he says, how could that be? The horsey is my best friend. The horsey would never hurt me. And the witchy woman says, I saw it in my crystal ball. Your horsey will cause you to die. So the farmer walks out of the tent. His head's in a tizzy. He can't think straight. He's like, what was that? So he goes home and he goes to bed. In the morning he wakes up and he goes out to the barn. There's his horsey friend and he puts the machinery on the horsey to grow, to go dig the ground, to grow the potatoes. And all day long, they're farming, 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 they're digging the holes to grow the potatoes. The next day, no problem, growing the potatoes. All week long, no problem at all. A month goes by. 
A year goes by, every day they grow the potatoes, no problem. The horsey is the farmer's best friend, and every day they grow the potatoes. Five years go by, no problem at all. The horsey and the farmer are best friends. Then, one day, because the horsey got so old, they're up in the back 40 and they're growing the potatoes, but then the horsey was old. So he laid down and the horsey died right there. And the farmer kneeled down next to the dead horsey and he goes, Horsey, you are my best friend. We grew a lot of potatoes together. I don't know why that witchy woman said what she did. The farmer said to the horsey, She was wrong, that witchy woman. She was wrong. You would never hurt me and I would never hurt you. You were my best friend. And the farmer said goodbye to his horsey friend. But then more years go by, years and years and years go by. And one day the farmer was working and very unusually finished up early. Usually farmers work till the sun goes down, but on this one day he finished up his work early and he said to himself, you know what, I'll go back up and say hello to my horsey friend. So he goes back up to where the horsey had died and there's the bones of the horsey laying there. And the farmer kneels down and he goes, Horsey, you were my best friend. He says, I'll always remember you. We grew a lot of potatoes together. And he knelt down next to the horsey. And just then, a rattlesnake popped out of the horsey's skull and bit the farmer. And the farmer died. So all in all, the witchy woman was right. And that's one of the stories I tell. I like that one. For some reason it has meaning to me. Now another story that I like to tell is a story that I saw on TV. I saw it on uh, like um, PBS. And it was actually geared towards children, but I think the story is very interesting. See if you like it. So the way the story goes is that there's this village and the people in the village are very poor. Uh, the floors of their houses are dirt floors and they live a poor person's life but they're you know they farm they grow chickens they grow tomatoes and you know they grow their own food that's how they survive one thing they do have is love so in this village there's this crooked road that runs through one part of town and on the crooked road there's these three families and in one house lives Pedro and Pedro has a wife and he has kids and he, he has his chickens and his tomatoes. Across the street from Pedro lives Juan. And Juan does his own farming. And he has like goats and a cow. But down the street, at the end of the street, is Fernando. And Fernando lives with his family. He's got a wife, a boy, a girl. And in Fernando's garden, he grows peas, squash, a little bit more elaborate. So in the village, not much happens. Every day they farm. Seven days a week they got to farm, good feed the animals and stuff like that. The only interesting thing that ever happens is once a year the circus comes to town and that's really their only entertainment. They're workers, they work. But one day, Fernando has to go to the dentist. He's got an appointment to go to see the dentist in town. So uh, he's not going to work that day. He's going to take the day off. He's going to walk into town and do what he's got to do. But he devises this plan. He's a little bit, he's smart. Fernando's a smart guy. He gets his wife to help him out with this <laughs> plan he's, that he's got. So his wife helps him and he asks her, he says, make me a hat. He says, but on, on the hat, I want one side of the hat to be just blue. And on the other side of the hat, it's going to be just red, right down the middle. One side's blue, one side's red. He says to his wife, can you make me the hat? And she says, oh, yes, yes, I'll make you the hat. So Fernando has the hat. And on the day that he's going to go to the dentist, he puts his hat on. And he right down the middle, one side's blue, one side's red. And he puts his hat on, and he's going to go to the dentist. So he walks out the door, and he's walking down the street of the cro crooked road. And he goes past Juan's house, and Juan's farming, farming, farming. 
And he looks up and he goes, Fernando, he says, you're not working today? Where are you going? And Fernando says, oh, I got to go to the dentist. I got an appointment. I'm walking into town. Uh, he says, Juan says, oh, yeah, well, good luck, good luck, good luck. So then across the street, Pedro hears everybody talking. And Pedro looks up because he's doing his farming. He looks up, he sees what's going on. He says, oh, he says, Fernando, he says, oh, where are you going? Fernando says, Fernando says, I'm going to the dentist. So Pedro says, uh, oh, you look different today. He says, oh, I like your nice red hat. That's a nice red hat. And Fernando, he don't say nothing. He, he, doesn't, turn, he doesn't turn his head. He keeps, keeps his head straight. So then he walks into town and he goes to the dentist. Well, later on in the day, when the sun goes down, Juan and Pedro, they, they stop their farming because it's the end of the day. And they, they're talking, they're talking, talking. And they say, oh, how's your tomatoes coming this year? And Juan says, oh, my tomatoes are good. I got good tomatoes this year. And then Pedro says, uh, oh, how'd you like that circus last week? Oh, that was a good circus. And, and Juan says, oh, yeah, it was a good circus. So then Pedro says, uh, oh, did you see Fernando today? He wasn't working. He, he was walking down the street. I, I saw him. He was wearing this red hat. And then... Uh, Juan says, yeah, I saw him too. I saw him walking down the street. He says, but I don't know why you said he had a red hat because when I saw him, he was wearing a blue hat. So Pedro says, blue hat? What are you talking about blue hat? He wasn't wearing a blue hat. He was wearing a red hat. And Juan says, what are you talking about? He was wearing a blue hat. So they look at each other like, what's the matter with you? So Juan says, what are you, nuts? And Pedro says, I'm not nuts. You're nuts. So then Juan is like, I always thought you were stupid, now I know, what are you talking about? The guy was wearing a blue hat, you're, t you're talking crazy. So now they're fighting back and forth, he says, I was wearing a red hat, and he's wearing a blue hat, and they're fighting, fighting. Well, finally, Juan pushes Pedro, Pedro, like, hits him. They're fighting, fighting, two friends, they're fighting each other. And they're rolling around on the ground, they're like, they're fighting each other. So then just then, Fernando's coming back. He's like walking back and he, he looks. He's like, what's going on? He can't believe what he sees. His two friends are fighting on the ground. So Fernando runs up. He's like, pushes him aside, pushes. He's like, what's going on here? Why are you guys fighting? And Pedro says, this guy's stupid. And I had to fight him because he was so stupid. He says, he told me you were wearing a blue hat. And I know that you were wearing a red hat. Juan says, I saw your hat. I saw it was blue. This other guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I always thought he was stupid. Now I know for sure. So we had a fight. And Fernando says, oh my God. He says, Fernando's like, oh my God. You guys are fighting about that? He says, you got, you kidding me. So he had the hat. Fernando had the hat in his back pocket. He takes it out. He shows it to him. He says, look. He says, one side was red and one side was blue. He says, you're both right. Why are you fighting about something so stupid? And Pedro and Juan looked at the hat. They're like, oh, my God. He said, oh, my, <laughs> he said, oh my God. Why are you, why are we? Oh, Pedro's like, Juan, I'm sorry. He's like, oh, you've always been a good friend to me. I'm, I'm sorry. And then Juan is like, I'm sorry. And then they were good friends again. But the moral of the story is, think about what you're fighting about. It's really... A lot of times it's stupid stuff, so that's a story that I heard, and that's a story I like. I Hopefully you liked it too. So anyways, now I got something extremely special for you in Donzi's world, because it's very rare, you don't see it very often, when Donzi sings a song. And I'm going to sing you a song right now. Now I've only sung one other song on Donzi's world, and that was when... I wrote the Harry Potter song. When all the Harry Potter books were coming out and people were going crazy for Harry Potter, I realized that there was no song. Even in the movies, the movies, you think they would invent a song for the movies, but they never did. So then I wrote the Harry Potter song and I sang it on TV. And um, that was the only, only other time that I sang a song. But now, <laughs> you are going to witness a special treat. Donzi is going to sing you a song. And this one is a little bit different than the Harry Potter song. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. I wrote this myself. It's an original Donzi 
original. And it goes, cheese before pizza, and cheese with pizza, and after pizza, cheese. I like pizza, and my dog likes pizza, and then we cut the cheese. <laughs> that's the song I wrote. <laughs> now that's a funny song. So now, the last story I want to tell you is a true story that happened to me. When I was younger, I traveled a lot. I used to pack up my car with my carpentry tools and my clothes and travel all around. When I was younger, it was easier because the places I lived, you can only do that stuff when you're young. And I learned a lot. But a lot of my traveling was between here and Key West, Florida. There was a lot of carpentry work in Key West and I used to go there every winter. I'd come back here in the summertime, go down there in the winter, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I did that for years and years and years. But the very first time I went to Key West, I was doing a carpentry job in New Haven for this guy. And one day he says to me, oh, I bought a house in Key West and I need someone to fix it up. Do you want to go down there and, and work on the house? And I said, oh yeah, of course I do, because I like traveling. Thought that was a good idea. So on the day I was going to leave Connecticut, I had my car all packed up. And uh, I went to the job where he was working. I says, oh, I'm all ready to go to Key West. I says, um, I'll call you when I get there. He, he says to me, oh, forget about it. We're not going to do that job anymore. He says, oh, forget about it. And I says, well, I said, well, my car's all packed up. I'm, I'm jumping on the highway right now. He says, oh, well, we're not going to do that job. So I jumped on the highway and I went there anyway. And I had no idea what Key West was, pff, anything about it. I just went there. So I get to Key West. It was like late at night. Slept in my car that night. I woke up in the morning and I got a newspaper and I went to the diner. And while I'm having my egg breakfast, I'm looking for a job in the want ads. And there was an advertisement that said Carpenter Wanted. So made a phone call, had an interview, got hired on the spot. So now I needed a place to live. So I take my newspaper, I go to the beach, and I'm on the beach and I'm reading my newspaper and I'm looking at the ads for rentals. And it dawned on me that to rent an apartment, you need first month's rent, last month's rent, and a security deposit. I, did, I didn't have a lot of money with me. So I realized there was no possible way I could live in Key West. I, and then I realized that I only had enough money to get back to Connecticut and I was all ready to jump in my car and drive straight back home again because that's all the money that I had. I could make it home and that's it. And I'm shaking my head like this and I'm going, oh, what am I, what's going on here? I look over, sitting across next to me on the beach a little ways down is a good buddy of mine from Hamden, Connecticut that I knew for a long time. And I seen him, he's sitting there, I'm like, what the heck? So at first, I didn't want to get up and say hello to him because I was embarrassed that I was, in a, I was in trouble and that I was in an embarrassing situation, you know, that I'd made this big mistake by going to Key West, you know, not being able to live there. And then I thought about it for a second, I'm like, wow, what am I doing? Of course I want to go say hello to my good buddy. So I go over there. Hey, how you doing? Oh, yeah, you know, a million miles away from home. I see my good friend. He tells me he's going to the Culinary Institute of America, and they sent him to Key West for on-the-job training, and he's living in an apartment with four bunk beds and only one other guy. He says, oh, come live with us. You can live in our apartment. So then I was able to live in Key West, and I did my job, my carpentry job, I was a cabinet maker there, had a great time. Key West is an awesome place. You ever get a chance to go there? Take a trip. It's Paradise Island. Everybody has a good time in Key West. So then, like I said before, I went to Key West year after year after year. The last time I went to Key West, it was 1999. And, um, I packed my car one day and I drove down to Key West. Nobody knew where I was going. My family didn't know. My friends didn't know. I just went. 
and I showed up into Key West with no plan at all. I had no nowhere to live. I had no job. I had just drove there. So I called my friend on the phone. He's a doctor. I did a lot of work for him. He helped me out in a couple different ways, and um, he was a good guy. So uh, his name was Pete. So I says, Dr. Pete, I says, look, I just showed up in Key West. This is, um, you know, I need a place to live, and, and, and do you know anybody who has work? And he says, oh, I'll make some phone calls, and uh, I'll talk to you later. So talk to him later. He says, oh, yeah, I've got a couple buddies who just bought a house and they want to open a real estate business and they need someone to live in the house and remodel it. So I says, hey, that's right up my alley. I do that all the time. So meet the guys, talking to them. You know, we made an agreement. Yeah, they trusted me. I'm a trustworthy guy. But then they told me, well, we haven't closed on the house. We don't, we're not going to own the house for another week. And I told them, you know, I just got into town. I have nowhere to live. And if I can't work for you, I'm going to get a job in the morning and, you know, I'll be gone. So they went and talked by themselves. They come back. They tell me they do property management for these condos in Key West. And there was one condo that was empty. They told me I could stay there until they closed on the other house and I can move into the other house so I can remodel it. And I said, yeah, that sounds great to me. Took me over to the condo million dollar condo on the water they said stay here till we call you I said sounds good to me I'll stay here no problem at all stayed in the condo a week later they called me on the phone they closed on the house moved into the house's two bedroom house had it to myself remodeled it into I remodeled it into a real estate office everything worked out great so that was the first time I went to Key West that was the last time I went to Key West and I had a lot of good times there a lot of good memories there and now there is just one more story that I want to tell. And it's another story that's true. It's not a fairy tale. And it's actually happening right now in America. Donald Trump is sitting in the White House. But in my opinion, he is not a legitimate president. During the campaign, you remember he was screaming, it's a rigged election. He would always say, it's a rigged election, folks. Guess what? It was a rigged election. And it was rigged by Russia. Russia influenced the last presidential election. And that's a true fact. Russia influenced the election in three different ways. The first thing that they did was they took stolen emails from the Democratic National Committee and they weaponized the emails and released them at strategic times to influence the election. You remember the day before the Democratic National Convention started? All the, all the Democratic emails came out and then the Democratic chairwoman, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, had to quit that day. It was the Russians who weaponized the emails. They influenced the election. That's the first thing they did. The second thing the Russians did was they spread fake news on social media like Facebook and Twitter. They were telling false stories to hurt Hillary Clinton and to help Donald Trump. That's what the Russians did. I remember one day I was at a party and someone told me, oh, did you hear the news? Hillary Clinton was about to be arrested. They were just about to arrest her. And I said, I watch the news every single day. I never heard that. And they said, oh, yeah, it's been all over the news. Yeah, she was just about to be arrested. And I'm thinking to myself, where did that come from? Well, it was Russian fake propaganda on Facebook. That's where they got the news from. So that's the second way Russia tried to influence the election with fake news. And lastly, we are now finding out that the Russians hacked into the voter registration systems of 21 states. You heard me right. They hacked into the voter registration systems of 21 states. And what they did was they changed the information for Democratic voters. They altered their address or they took them off the rolls completely. So when the Democrats went to go vote, they had problems. The, the people at the voting place would say, 
oh, we have the wrong address for you. You can't vote today. Or they would say, you already voted by absentee ballot. You can't vote today. So Democrats had trouble voting because the Russians had altered the voter registration list. So what I could tell you is that Vladimir Putin did change votes in the last election. Donald Trump is not a legitimate president. And more information about this will come out soon. Watch the news for that. Now there's someone looking into all this stuff. There is a special prosecutor named Robert Mueller who's investigating all this stuff. What he's actually investigating is that whether or not Donald Trump had committed treason against the United States. If Donald Trump helped Russia do any of the stuff that I talked about, then that is treason. That's an attack against America. And I could tell you that the only other time that a president was investigated for treason was in the 1980s during Iran-Contra. Ronald Reagan was investigated for treason when he sold weapons to the enemy and then lied about it. So think about that for one second. Two presidents have been investigated for treason, Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump. So there you go. Keep watching the news. The facts are out there. But anyways, that's all I wanted to say in this episode of Donzi's World. I hope you enjoyed it. I have a lot more stories to tell. Maybe someday I'll come back and tell you more stories. I got a million of them. But for now, I'll say happy day and bye-bye. See you next time.